If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, uh, our, our country uh, remembered uh, D-Day. Uh, June 6th was the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, D-Day was when the Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. Uh, and at that time, it was the largest military operation in the history of the world. Over 150,000 men were involved in the assault, and on that day, about 4,000 men were killed in the battle. And that day made a mark on history. Uh, here we are, we're 80 years later, we're remembering the events of that day. Historians have noted that D-Day uh, was a, a turning point in the war. It was the beginning of the end of World War II. Uh, and even to this day, the world owes a debt of gratitude uh, to the men who fought against the tyranny of Nazi Germany. Uh, sadly, somebody noted that we are losing the men who fought this day and made the D-Day successful. Every year, fewer and fewer of them uh, are around to, to tell us uh, what it was like on that day. We, we come to remember uh, men in another way today. Today, we are celebrating Father's Day. Uh, it's a day of appreciation uh, for the men uh, who have raised us, uh, and there's a lot of different things that we appreciate uh, about uh, men, our dads. Uh, some of the things we, we might note uh, uh, that dads are good for, uh, uh, I, want, I uh, appreciate that there's a whole brand of humor that is specifically dedicated to dads called dad jokes. Uh, I used to be addicted to the hokey pokey, but I turned myself around. <laughs> ah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we think about dads. Dads can do a whole lot of different things. Dads can swap a transmission out. Dads can have a great looking lawn. Dads can build a house. Uh, dads can wrestle an alligator. Dads can grow a great beard. Dads can take care of mom. Dads uh, teach us how to do so much stuff. Uh, and these are just a couple of examples, a couple of reasons that I want to make this statement this morning. Manhood matters. It is important, and we need it today. Culturally, we're in a time uh, when long-standing ideas about manhood, even the essential biological nature of manhood, is being called into question. Uh, the ideas about what it means to be a man and why manhood matters are hot topics in the world that we live in. And this morning for our time together, I, I want to quote uh, a Marine recruiting campaign from years gone by uh, that really states the need of the church this morning. We are looking for a few good men. I want you to read with me in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 15. Paul is writing to young Timothy and giving him some advice uh, about uh, what should be in churches. And listen to what he says. Starting with verse 1, it says, The saying is, tr is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, nor violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare, a snare of the devil." 
deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-minded, or not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first that they uh, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. In this uh, passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, Paul is giving some ideas of what men need to be like in positions of leadership in the church. And I want to kind of start backwards, and, and, uh, and we're going to look at verse, at verse 15. I want you to just make a note in your Bible. Uh, Paul says, uh, 14 and 15, he says, I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Now, what we see is Paul writing here in chapter 3, he's writing uh, his reason, his purpose for this letter. He is telling uh, Timothy, he's saying, this, write this down, this is what uh, you need to know. I want you to know this, and it's important enough that I want to go ahead and write it now uh, just so you'll have it in case I get delayed when I come to you. Uh, this verse is actually the theme of the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, it is uh, Paul's stated purpose in writing. I'm writing so that you will know how people ought to behave in the church of God. Uh, we read in our Bible, our English Bibles, the ESV uses the word ought. Uh, I'm, there are some other translations, other words that are used out there, but really the idea when, when Paul is writing that this is how it ought to be, this is how people ought to be in the church, uh, another way we could say that than be faithful to what this, the Scripture is uh, intending for us is this. He says this is what the church needs to be. This is how it ought to be. This is what it needs to be to be. And so this morning, I want to talk about the kinds of men that the church needs. As we read, chapter 3 gives us details about the kinds of lives that are necessary for the men who would serve the church in the position of overseer or deacon. And we might describe these men as men of conviction, men of character, and men of competence. Uh, we, we need, uh, before we dive into looking at these offices, these qualifications of overseers and deacons, I, I think we do need to make a clarifying distinction that is going to impact our understanding about this passage, and it's going to help us in understanding our church this morning. Uh, later in the book of 1 Timothy, Timothy uh, is given instruction by Paul about godliness, how important it is for godliness to be a part of Timothy's life, of pastors' lives. And we read in these, these qualifications uh, for deacons and for overseers uh, that godliness is an important thing. But lest you uh, leave this morning saying, well, there wasn't really anything for me in the sermon today, I, I just want to say that godliness should be the goal of every believer. Every person who claims the name of Christ should be trying to grow in godliness. Our lives should get to the point where we are living a godly life. And while it is the goal of every believer, this passage of Scripture that we read this morning says it's a requirement. It is an essential for those who would serve in the office of overseer or deacon. 
Uh, in the same way, we read in the Scriptures that uh, it is uh, essential that everyone in the church uh, is a teacher and a servant. Uh, there are other verses that we could go to that show us that every one of us needs to be teaching the things that we know to someone else. And that every one of us, no matter what our place or part in the body, we all have a role to serve in the body. And so there are general ways that the Scripture uh, speaks about teaching or service. Uh, this morning, we are going to focus on some specific things or roles that, that the Scripture has to say about who uh, teaches and who serves and I hope that you will recognize the, the broad application that, that these things we will talk about this morning can apply to so many more people than, than those who would serve in the role of a deacon or the role of a pastor. Uh, and so there's a broad application, but there is a specific application that we're going to spend our time on this morning uh, about what uh, life in the church must be like. Uh, so as Paul writes, he, he's given this instruction uh, and he teaches us what kind of men should be serving the church as overseers and deacons. Uh, we are not going to take the time to talk about each description this morning, but there are four qualities uh, that we will talk about this morning, four qualities that describe the kind of men that the church needs. First of all, the church needs men of the message. Uh, we need men of the message, and uh, we, we could start in chapter 1 defining what the message is. How do we understand the message? Uh, and really, in chapter 1, we go back, and Paul is giving an account of the message. He's giving his own personal testimony. In chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, he is writing, and he says, uh, Formerly, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say it. And here is the message. Here is the thing that we are gathered here this morning for. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the message that we need to be committed to. This is what Paul was committed to. He was a man of the message, and he was telling Timothy to be a man of the message, and that we need people in the church today who will be men of the message. You know, in every one of our lives, as every, every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who has been reborn from on high, every believer has different details and different circumstances about uh, when they came to Christ and how, what their conversion was like. But honestly, the core parts of our testimony are really all the same. Uh, that we, we find that, that all of our lives fall into this general description. We were all dead in our sins consumed with ungodly passions and acting out of all our unbelief. But the grace of God was poured out on us through Jesus Christ because He came to seek and save sinners like me. Every person that's a true believer in Christ will be able to say those things this morning about the message of why Jesus came. Uh, there are some things in our, our qualifications for deacons and pastors or overseers that, that I would make note of that how overseers and how deacons need to be men of the message. The first thing that I would point out about the message that, that we need to, to see is that the message teaches right doctrine and righteous living. Uh, opening up in chapter 1, uh, Paul introducing the letter and kind of setting up the things that he's going to say to young Timothy. Uh, he wants to give Timothy a charge. Uh, so he actually uses, ESV uses the word charge in several places. And, and what a charge is, it's really a military term. Uh, Paul is giving an order. He is telling Timothy what his orders are for the church. Paul had been on these missionary journeys. He had been teaching in Ephesus. He had spent some time with the people there. Paul had to leave, and when he left, he left Timothy in place uh, to make sure that things continued to go well in the church. And so 
Timothy, or Paul gives Timothy a charge, a military order, and he writes in 1 Timothy, he says, I I charge you in this way, I want you to wage the good warfare. And so he is telling Timothy, there is a battle to be fought, and that as you are looking out for this church, I want you to fight this fight of faith. And so it it was really about the, the idea of doctrine. Uh, chapter 1, and if you take the time, go back and read it. I hope some of you were able to read 1 Timothy this week. Uh, maybe you'll, you'll see some of this, but if not, go and read it this week and kind of see what is here. In chapter 1, there's two times that Paul talks about doctrine as he's writing to Timothy. And it's like the first issue of uh, a business that we need to take care of. The first thing I would bring to your attention are these matters of doctrine. And he writes and he says, uh, there are those uh, who are teaching a different doctrine. Different than what the Apostle, the Apostle Paul had spent his time teaching to the church. And that there had been people rise up in the church who began to teach something different than what he had taught. And so in verses, uh, uh, in chapter 1, he says there is this different doctrine. And he describes it, myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations. Uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, this different doctrine that was being promoted in the church. He said, this is a, this is a problem. But then he also writes in chapter 1, in verses 8 through 11, uh, he writes to Timothy to point out things that not only are different to doctrine, but he says uh, that there are things happening. He points out things that are contrary to sound doctrine. And when he uses the phrase contrary to sound doctrine, he really uses it to describe the lives that people are living. Uh, He talks about people who are living in unrighteousness and evil. Uh, And he says that they are not living their lives in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed Christ. And he makes the equation that sound doctrine is the gospel of the glory of Christ. And he says not only is there these wrong ideas, wrong theology, but there's wrong living in the church, and we need, we need to uh, make a note of this. And so this issue of having right doctrine is something that is on the heart of the Apostle Paul. Uh, these false teachers not teaching the truth. Uh, and this really sets the tone for us, how we understand, how we read the book of 1 Timothy. So that when we get to 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, there, are some in, there is some information for overseers. Those who would be in a position to, to manage in the church and to look out for the church, to protect the church. In chapter 3, uh, the scripture says that overseers must be men of the message. Uh, and it says particularly that overseers must have the ability to teach. They must be able to teach. Uh, This would be their primary job, to teach and oversee the teaching of the church. Uh, This teaching is gospel proclamation that leads to salvation and sanctification. Uh, This teaching is also applying the gospel to the lives of people so that their lives would be in accordance with the gospel of the glory of Christ. Uh, that that, uh, overseers uh, should teach how the gospel changes us, not only in salvation when we are born again or we are uh, saved from our wicked ways of life, but talks about how sanctification takes place, that day by day we're growing in godliness, we're becoming more and more like Christ, all because of this gospel message. And the church needs men of the message who are going to teach right doctrine. And the scripture says that overseers, or elders or pastors are ones that are there or the end that are given this job. Uh, it is uh, interesting if we look uh, at the qualifications of deacons and the qualifications for overseers, there is a lot that overlaps. Uh, there are a lot of things that are similar that would be almost down the line, the same expectations for overseers and deacons. 
uh, there is one glaring or one main way that these two descriptions are wrong. In the description of an overseer or an elder or a pastor, again, these words are all synonymous. Uh, in the differences between a pastor and an elder, the description that we read that is different, the main difference is this, is that overseers must have the ability to teach. It is not necessarily said of deacons. It's, that's not to say that deacons cannot teach and do not teach, but it is, it is saying that anyone holds the office of overseer must be able to teach. So this is one of those areas where, where in general, we all teach, we all serve, but there are specific things that the Scripture says to people in certain roles or positions that is a key component of their job. And that is one thing that it says, that men of the message uh, need to teach right doctrine, and this is a major responsibility of pastors and overseers. Uh, to be men of the message uh, means that the, the message teaches rigorous devotion. Uh, when we read in chapter 3, verse 9, we read that deacons, it says, uh, must hold to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. I would invite you to go and look, uh, read 1 Timothy, do a little study. Talk, that word conscience shows up several times uh, in the book of 1 Timothy. Also, holding to the faith is, is a phrase that is repeated uh, in the Scripture. And, and this idea of mystery. Now, what, what is mystery? We talked about this a, a little bit when we were in Colossians. We talked about that there were things hidden in the Old Testament that people did not know. Uh, that there was these promises and prophecies about Jesus who would come. They didn't know his name was going to be Jesus. They didn't know all the details of his life. They didn't know that he was going to come and die on a cross and be buried and resurrected again. They didn't know all of these things. These, these things were a mystery that were hidden in the Old Testament, but now have been shown. They have been revealed. And when the, when the Scripture says here that deacons need to be men who hold to the mystery of faith, uh, it is uh, men who are men of the message in that they're holding on to this key revelation about who Jesus Christ is. Verse 16 goes a little further with this. We didn't read it, but it says here is the mystery of godliness. And it goes on to give in poetic form some, some truths about Jesus Christ. Uh, if your Bible is like mine, it's set off in different type and a different uh, format, and that's to show us uh, that there's something else going on here. Uh, a lot of Bible scholars think that this is possibly an early Christian hymn that the church sang about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and they said this is the mystery of godliness, uh, that Jesus, what, he lived and he was shown in the world and that he was buried and that he was raised again. And this revelation about Jesus Christ, this is the mystery. And so Paul is saying that we need men in the church, deacons, who are going to hold on to the mystery uh, of faith which, with a clear conscience. Uh, so uh, here is this, this idea. Men are going to believe the gospel message and it is going to impact the way they live. Uh, that these godly men, these deacons, are going to, by holding on to the faith, they are going to be living out what is described. And I would like you to write this down. Right theology is going to lead to right living. There has been a lot of wrong theology and that a wrong teaching that has happened in the churches down through the years, and it's led people to go shipwreck with their faith is a term that's used in 1 Timothy. False teaching leads to shipwreck in the faith. But right teaching, right theology is going to lead to right living. And we see here that these men, these by holding on to the faith, they are committed not only to the message of Christ, but to living it out in day-to-day -day lives. And we see in the other descriptions that are written about deacons, what kind of men they need to be. We see that, that the men of the message who are going to live out the truth of the gospel are seen in these other distinctions uh, that are put in the Scripture. 
Uh, and uh, so here is the idea uh, that in spite of influence from false teachers, these men are going to stand fast and they are going to stand firm in the faith. They are not going to be swayed by the lie, the seductive lives of false teachers, but they are going to stand firm on the Word of God. They are going to hold on to the message even when the circumstances around them are telling them they shouldn't believe the message of the Christ. Uh, deacons should be men who remain committed to the message of Christ. Again, here is something that it says specifically about a particular kind of man holding a particular place in the church. But there is a broad application for all of us that we need to know right doctrine. We need to believe right doctrine and we need to go uh, live our lives with rigorous devotion, committed to the things that the scripture says, that we would live our lives in accordance with the gospel. The next thing that the, the church needs is men of maturity. The church is go, it needs men of maturity. And these are men who have, have reached a full-grown faith. We talked about this a few weeks back of what it is to grow up in the Lord. That we, uh, It's like uh, children uh, as they grow. We watch them. They, they go from being babies to toddlers to, to kids to teens to young men to old men. And we talk about this growth process. And, and there is something to be said in these, uh, these descriptions of overseers and deacons that they need to be men who have a full-grown faith for overseers. It gives this, this instruction that anybody who wants to serve in the role of an overseer or a pastor or an elder uh, must not be a new convert. Uh, a new convert, it says that you need to be established in your faith. Uh, you cannot be a recent believer and be in a position of leadership uh, in the church as a pastor or an overseer. And it comes with a warning. It, it gives a prescription. It gives a, a statement, not a new convert, but it also comes with a danger. Uh, and the scripture says that, that a new convert might be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, that there is a pride that creeps in in a position of leadership. That those who, who have the, the position of leadership begin to, to, to think about themselves in a wrong way. And that is a way that the devil attacks those who are in leadership. They, they are puffed up or swollen up with pride and begin to fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, and it says that men who would serve in, in, in the role of a pastor or position of leadership should not be new, but should have uh, grown up in the faith so that he is not uh, filled with pride. Also in this passage, in the description about the position of an overseer or the position of a pastor, I must live a life that has been shown over time to be faithful and consistent, uh, that it has taken time, it takes time to grow up in the Lord. And, and there are several instances in this passage that show that. Uh, that, the, that this kind of man who has been an overseer uh, is going to have shown over time uh, consistency in following the Lord so that he has earned respect uh, from the people that are around him, that, that uh, men of maturity, that uh, overseers uh, are, are full-grown spiritually uh, and they are respected. They have shown uh, through time that they are living a faithful life. For deacons, it says that to be men of maturity, Scripture says uh, that they must be uh, tested. Uh, it says, uh, it says uh, let them be tested first, and then let them serve if, as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. And so what, what is the Scripture saying? What is Paul saying? He's saying in, in, being, in looking over the church and considering men who might fall into this position or uh, who take this position of deacon, uh, you should have your eye on some people. And that as you have your eye on them and you notice some things about them that would seem to qualify them for this kind of office in the church, he says you need to test them. 
Uh, and that's not to, to lay a stumbling block in front of them or tempt them with things to see if they fall into sin. But uh, we need to give them opportunities to minister. We need to give them opportunities to serve and see how they, they serve and carry out the duties that are set before them. And if they continue to remain faithful to the Lord and follow the message uh, that God has given. And so uh, these men, it says they need to be tested and trustworthy and blameless. Now, you may read that and you think, blameless? Uh, who, who, who qualifies for that? Aren't we really talking about an impossible standard? Are, are we talking about somebody who's got to be perfect in every way? And really, that is not the, the point that we're making in the Scripture. To say uh, that they're, they're tested and trustworthy and blameless is not to say that they're perfect. One commentator has put it this way, it's not perfection but personal integrity. It's not, not uh, uh, perfection, but, but maturity. These, these are the kinds of men that the church needs, men's, men who have grown up in maturity. Another thing the Scripture says that the church needs, the church needs men of marital and fa familial fidelity. I don't know how many of y'all have watched the news in the last few weeks uh, about, about what makes news these days. Uh, did you know that it is controversial to say that there is a normal way and a beneficial way to understand the family. And that if you say something along these lines, you are going to be roasted in the media. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Have y'all followed the news? Do you know what's happening in the world? Uh, that there, there is a, a, a kicker for a professional football team who, who made some statements about marriage and how it would be good for women to get married and to, to have children and what kind of uh, good uh, they are providing for the world and what kind of satisfaction it might bring to them. And right here, we would not think of that as being crazy talk, right? But this guy has been roasted in the world for saying these things about a traditional understanding of what family is. Uh, to, for that, that a, a man and a woman should get married and have kids. Uh, that's what makes news today. And that should tell you something about where our world is at. For the history of mankind, this has been how it goes. A man grows up and marries a woman and they, for the most part... Uh, have children and pass on uh, their family and their family names. And, and that we, we, we know this is the normal way that it goes. But in our world today, marriage and family are under attack and that you say anything that, that hints at some kind of normal or even beneficial way to think about the family. And, and it is, it is uh, World War uh, over, over these ideas. But we know that marriage is a great good in the world. It is a, a blessing from God, and it is the, the, the foundation of our society. Uh, we know that, that the family is what the, our nation is built on. It's what our church is be, built on. Uh, and it, there, there is a great deal of personal satisfaction in having a family, uh, having a, a, a mom and a dad who are, who are there raising their children, as we heard one of our kids read this morning, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. This is the normal family that God would portray in the Scripture. And in if, uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he says that we need men who are going to be committed to this idea. Men who are committed to marital and familial fidelity. He says this is what we've got to have. This is absolutely necessary in the church. Uh, and that overseers and deacons must be this kind of man. A man who manages his own household well. Uh, it says that of both uh, pastors and deacons, they must manage their own household well. And I want you to notice there's something else in the Scripture. When we study, we always want to look for things that are repeated. We want to look for key words, and we want to look for ideas that are being developed. Uh, so would you, do you notice, do you see that Paul writes and he says, uh, pastors must be men who manage their own households well. And then he says, uh, deacons uh, should manage their own households well. And then down verse uh, 15, uh, look, he says, uh, um, 
when he writes his purpose statement, I'll, I'll write this so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. The household of God. And so uh, we, we have <clears throat> Paul saying the family household, being faithful to it, managing it well. There's a correlation between managing your family household well and, and being faithful to the household of God. Do you see that? Do you see that in your Bible? This is what, this is what Paul's saying. He's saying that there is a connection between men who are going to be faithful to their wives and care about their children. That there is, That is good evidence for us to think that when they come into the church that they're not going to cheat on the church. They're going to care about the raising up of children in the church and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And that's what kind of men that the church needs today. We need men who are going to be faithful to their marriage and faithful to their families uh, and faithful to their churches. Uh, this, uh, this, there is one distinction to make in, in our description of, between pastors and deacons. It, it does say of both of those that they need to be able to manage their own households well, uh, that they need to be able to take care of the business of their household. Uh, but as we read in the two descriptions, it does say one thing about pastors that it doesn't say about deacons. Uh, pastors are given the responsibility of overseeing the household of God, that an overseer must be one who is looking out for the, the, the needs of the church. Uh, and so a distinction would be made in, in, in that. So uh, Paul writes to, to pastors and he makes this statement, if he doesn't know how to rule his own household, how he, will he care for the church of God? How will he care for the church of God? So there, there is a question uh, about those who would pastor and the last thing I want to share with you this morning, the last kind of men uh, that the, the church needs is the church needs men of the moment. The church needs men of the moment. Now, this passage <clears throat> gives a lot of detail about the kind of men that the church needs to be in the position of overseer and deacon. But we're left asking the question, but what should they do? What, you know, does the Bible give us a job description for pastors and deacons? Does it tell us what, what our roles and our, our responsibilities are? And I, I hope to dive into that, uh, the jobs of pastors from Scripture uh, in uh, the week or weeks to come. Uh, the work of pastors, I would, I would uh, give a very brief description, is, is the work of, of knowing, leading, feeding, and protecting the sheep. Uh, for pastors to be men of the moment. It means mu that they must know themselves. They must know their flock and they must know the world around them. And they need to be able to stand up and speak the truth of the Word of God to themselves, to the people in their church and to the world that's around us. Uh, God, we, God has uh, made men with the ability to, to speak this word and pastors need to be men of the moment that as situations and circumstances arise, that men will speak up their str the truth of the scripture to the world that's around them. This is the kind of man that the church needs to speak the truth of God when the opportunity has come our way. Uh, what about for deacons though? What, what does it mean for deacons to be men of the moment? And there is not a job description in Scripture for deacons. There, there is no uh, list of all the things that a deacon must do. There is a lot of attention given to their character. It's given a, 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 some, some idea about their conviction. Uh, but it doesn't really tell us what they need to do. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we looked at Acts chapter 6, and we uh, said that uh, here was a specific instance in the life of the early church when men were selected to meet a particular need, and that uh, many commentators uh, think that this is kind of the inauguration of the office of deacon. Commentator, commentators are divided. Not all commentators come to that conclusion, uh, but, but this is uh, uh, the where I fall, that I believe that this is the, the 
uh, inauguration of the office of deacon, that here is a description of a specific instance uh, that, that needed help, that, that in, there needed to be servants who are going to do this. Uh, but at the same time, I want to recognize that, that here's an example of how it could be. I don't want to go so far as saying that this provides a model for every church everywhere about what life in church should be like. Uh, so, uh, even though it's a good example, it's not necessarily fits with the circumstances and the situation that we are in. And here, here is the, the idea, the, the conclusion that I've come to is that for deacons uh, to be men of the moment, it means this, uh, that they're ready to serve when needs arise. Whatever the needs might be in the church, whatever situations might arise that, that require somebody uh, to, to step in and to get involved and to do something about it, deacons need to be that kind of man who's going to step into the position ready to serve and meet the needs that are there. They are men who are strong in the faith, studied in the Scripture, and servants who are going to meet, what, meet whatever needs come up in the church. And I can again say that we, we have some men in our church serving as deacons who are doing this. They are men of the message. They are men uh, of uh, maturity. They are men of marital and familial fidelity. And they are men of the moment. And again, we, we need to have some, uh, some, some general observation that all of these things could be things that we could seek to grow in uh, and be faithful in. The church needs men. And uh, this morning as we consider these things, I, I know there's a lot of questions uh, that we can't really answer, time that we don't have to get into to, to talk about different things. And I would just uh, say by, by uh, quick uh, overview, uh, next Sunday night we're going to have a family meeting and I'm inviting you to come uh, so that we will have opportunity to talk specifically about some of the questions that are coming up as a result of our study. Uh, so next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we're going to have this family meeting. We're going to have some time to, to sit down and discuss some of these ideas about the church. Of course, I welcome uh, questions, comments. Uh, you know, text me, call me, set an appointment for us to get together and talk about it. I'd be glad to do any of those things. I do want us to bow our heads and go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we're closing out our, our time of study this morning. God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the, your word and what you teach us in it. God, I pray that we would have open eyes and open ears and a heart that we would be receptive to your word. God, you have given us instruction. You have given us revelation about your word and what things ought to be or need to be in the church. And God, I pray that we would strive hard. We would go hard to, to make these things happen in our church. God, I thank you for the blessings that you have given us, the, the men who are serving, uh, Lord, in, in these ways. And God, I pray your blessings on their life. Lord, we commit ourselves to you at this time, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.